Here's a pretty crazy story about my mom. She had her legs like run over by like a 16 wheeler. <laughs> what? Good, What's good, bro? Cheers, brother. Cheers, man. Welcome to the Nomadic Mike. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. Nah, it's my pleasure, dude. Always. Oh. It's so funny how we've been trying to get this done for like three years, I think. It's been way too long. The first time I asked was November 2020. Has it been that long? Yeah, that was the first time I asked, and you were like, bro, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, and then I had, I had plans, right? Yeah. But at the same time, the podcast was juvenile yeah, at that time. And right. I think I was also still trying to figure out exactly what kind of guests I was trying to bring on, mm. what kind of conversations we would facilitate. And now I think the podcast is in a place where it's maturing, it, it's maturing and it makes yeah. sense to have you on now because I think you've really grown as a person mm -hmm. in the last three years as have I. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And that's a big reason why we're here. Before we get started, I just want to let the audience know. So John and I have been really close friends for a very long time now. It's been about nine years, nine which years. is impossible to think about because after a certain age, I think time just starts passing very, very quickly. It's ridiculous how fast time, <laughs> like it just flies by. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what I find really interesting about our relationship is as Many of you probably already know I come from a very academic background, as in my parents are academics, and that's the kind of family background that I've been brought up in, whereas John has been brought up in a family of renowned actors. And your life experience growing up in that household has always been interesting to me, mm -hmm. but in all of our hangouts, I don't think we've talked about it very much in depth. No. Um, no. And not for any particular reason. It just doesn't come up, right? Yeah, and so really this up. is a really good opportunity for us to not only talk about that, but for, I suppose, your fans yeah. or fans of you know your parents uh, to get a glimpse into what your life has been like growing up in that Absolutely. family. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the times, because uh, it's... It, I mean, I just grew up like that, you know, and it, it hasn't really been something that occurred to me that I'm like, oh, I live this separate life because I'm a celebrity son. But um, I guess it really does affect me in ways that I haven't really processed fully as well, because mm. it's not something that I like to advertise. Of course. Like when I'm working or when I'm meeting new people, I'm not like, oh, hey, by the way, you know, like that's sort of weird to do that. And yeah. I don't really feel the need to do that most of the time because I feel like I have a pretty strong identity and like personality on my own so yeah. um yeah it's just never really like everyone knows but it's never really like a huge thing you know like I always feel like I'm not so different from the next guy so um, yeah that's why it doesn't come up but I'm happy to take a deep dive and hopefully learn some stuff on the way for sure I think uh, a good place to start would be talking about who your parents are sure. and why are they well known in specifically in the in the Hong Kong movie industry, but mm. the Hong Kong movie industry, as many people know, was a renowned global oh, yeah. world class oh, yeah. industry of cinema yeah. at a specific uh, time mm -hmm. at which your parents were yeah. in their prime. Yeah. So maybe you can tell us about that just to start off. Right. So my dad is Grand Dai Wai, David Chang. Um, renowned actor from the early 70s in Hong Kong. Uh, he worked for Shaw Brothers and he did tons of martial arts movies. He was the guy on the horse with the sword and the guy that always dies at the end trying to do something valiant and something heroic. Um, and my mom is, uh, she used to always be, uh, also be an actress. Uh, her name is Maggie, Lei Lam Lam. And uh, she was her first ever like starring role mm. she was like 16 mm. it's crazy like both my parents started acting really really young um my dad started acting when he was like four because his parents were actors my grandparents they were actors as well and so it was at the time 
acting didn't bring in a lot of money mm. and so it was sort of like a, okay we're actors why don't we get our kids into it and you know that's where my dad's journey started um till now dad's still working he's 75 years old definitely not always the leading guy anymore but you know he's still working and he's still filming several things a year he works in china he works for tvb um i filmed something with him uh last year and so yeah it's been a hell of a ride for both of them i'd say and uh at one point i tried to take up the mantle mm -hmm. um but yeah we can you know go deeper on that later on for sure yeah uh i mean the fact that you brought that up i feel like is a really good in into one topic of conversation today which is legacy and legacy. i think that might be a cool place to start because you know, both of us are in our 20s. Yeah. Uh, you know, both of us are past 25. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's important to mention, right? Mm. Because my view of what a 25 plus year old was when I was 20 or yeah. when I was 18 was like they have just arisen from a coffin and they've pretty much just they're they're old, you yeah. know, <laughs> they're old people. Yeah. Um, but now that I am at this stage of my life, I realize that the first half of my 20s was very much about experimentation. Um, and going through a lot of emotions uh, relating to identity, 100%. you know, who am I, Absolutely. Uh, who am I trying to become? Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, you have many people around you because of college, your first mm. job, and you're being pulled in a lot of directions. Mm. Right. And it's it's a it's a hard place to be in mentally and physically to try and forge your identity. Yeah. It, well, it's hard because you're being pulled in so many directions, but it's also forging of an identity because you are put in those situations. Yeah. Um, but then comes your family, right? And you reach a certain point where it's like, okay, the outside world has influenced me in all these ways, but I grew up in a certain family mm. that taught me these things, and mm. this is my family background. Yours being acting and an actor's family in the spotlight as well. How do you feel like you're your journey has been from the time you were like, let's say 18 to Oof. now. Um, honestly, like I mentioned it earlier, like as a kid, I didn't really realize the burden that I carry or it's not a burden, but it's sort of like just being from that background. It's so different from everyone else just because 99.9% .9 of the population isn't from the same background as, as I am. Yeah. Um, and I think from 18 where you sort of like start having really truly start having your own consciousness and as you said like forging an identity at the time I was like I didn't really like announcing it to people that I was like an actor's son and like carrying that mantle because at the time I guess it was like it felt like oh it's just annoying I don't want to like deal with that I want to forge my own path but I, now looking back on it it's sort of like it's sort of stressful like mm. the way that people look at you or like uh, uh, treat you and this happens to this day even though i'm like my own man now it's like it's different like the way that people treat you after they find out mm -hmm. and before they find out it's like you know obviously at first it's like a million questions and then some people treat you differently like really differently like oh they're always very kind to you and they're very like you know it's like they're trying to cater to you and like you know, I, I really, really didn't like that when I was like 18 to mm. 22, I'd say. Mm. Um, so that was when we met, right? Like during college. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's a burden. I would say there's definitely a stress that comes with it because my family's built this identity. My family's built this reputation and anything I could do could potentially taint my father's image. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's not something I think about all the time because I think my parents raised me the right way and like sort of I'm well-mannered, I'm respectful, I'm very friendly and open to everyone. But um, there were moments where I felt that pressure, you know, um, especially after I decided to join the entertainment industry and I was being judged strictly from the eyes of someone who knows who my father is, mm. right? Uh, it's quite interesting because a lot of people who want to be actors, entertainers, musicians, they join in the industry, no one cares, right? You just gotta build your way up until people do care. Yeah. The moment it was announced that I was joining the industry and I was gonna be in a movie, mm -hmm. hate comments, like wow. straight up news articles, 
magazine articles, like just so much stuff happening and people calling me up and saying, oh, hey, I heard you're joining the industry. I'm like, who's this? Like, I don't even know who you are. How did you get my number? You know, like, wow. it, like that's sort of how public our information is. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something I had to juggle uh, even more so after I joined the industry. And that was when I really, really felt that like pressure of like, oh crap, I'm in the spotlight. Mm. Not because of what I've done, but because of what my father's done. So I really got to step my game up. Mm -hmm. I got to be careful with what I say and what I do. And I just got to, you know, carry that, <laughs> I guess, burden, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, it's helped me in many ways. At the same time, it's also put a lot of pressure on me in many ways. But I don't regret it or anything. I don't, I don't you know, wish I was someone different. Like, it's just, that's just my life. And yeah. that's what I grew up with, you know? Mm. Yeah. You began this career thrust into the spotlight, yeah. something you didn't ask for, yeah. something no one really asks for, yeah. you know, but you've somehow found yourself working as a chef today yeah. in a famous kitchen in Hong Kong. I'd say like a reputable, reputable establishment, yeah. a reputable establishment. I think that's uh, admirable because you are out here exploring your interests. Mm. But is there a reason that you've shifted from being on TV, <laughs> being in movies, to now being a chef? Man, that's a long story. Um, I'll start off with like the earliest thing that I can mention is that I started cooking when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I had just come back to Hong Kong not too long ago, and I was going to this uh, sort of local middle school. Mm. And in local school, we have this thing called Guan Fun, which is army training. Okay. And basically <laughs> what they do is they ship these kids off into China for like a week. And you go to like a military camp. And you have to live there for a week. And like you do push-ups, you march, and you got to say yes, sir. You know? And cool. uh, one of the activities that year was we're going to learn how to cook. Nice. And so I asked uh, my mom. I was like, hey, like I got to learn how to cook. Like. What, what, what do I do? Like, I don't know how to cook. And she was like, why don't you start here? Try making the veggies tonight. Try mm. cooking the rice tonight. And like, so I started there. And that was sort of when I first um, had my first interaction with like the stove. Um, mm. And ever since then, I've been cooking. And so that's something that has been with me since preteen or like early teens. Um, so it's always been in the back of my mind. It's like, oh, fallback could be, I could be a chef because I know I like it, you know? Um, so fast forward to being in the industry and experiencing all these different things and learning all these different things and meeting different people, being in movies, being in competitions, singing in front of hundreds of people, um, joining a management company. Um, super long story with that, but we can you know get into that later. Uh, it really was after I joined the management company where I started questioning is this really something that I want to keep doing? Is this really something that, is it really my dream or have I convinced myself that it's my dream because of my family background or mm. because it's sort of like the easy way out where I don't have to climb the nine to five ladder and be, do a blue collar job. Mm. Um, that's one thing about entertainment that's really nice is like a lot of the time you're in control of your own schedule. Yeah. Like when you have a job, you got to do the job. But when you're off the job and you don't have a job, you can do whatever you want. I can go to the gym every day if I wanted to. Mm. I could wake up late. I can sleep late. I can chill with whoever I want to hang out with. Um, so that was one really nice part. And that's something that I miss to this day. Because mm. uh, right now I'm super busy as a chef. And I'm sure everyone knows like being a chef is definitely not the easiest job. Mm. Uh, long hours, a lot of physical labor and a lot of stuff to think about. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I transitioned was because so I joined management. And things were going smoothly, a lot of ups, ups and downs, which is just the nature of the industry. Mm. It gets quiet, it mm. gets super busy. You have to deal with people that you don't want to deal with. Yeah. Um, and basically through that, uh, I started questioning, is this something I want to do? Mm. Fast forward to earlier this year, mm -hmm. uh, actually end of last year, uh, there was this huge incident in a concert Mm. In Hong Kong, I'm sure you saw the video and a lot of people saw the video yeah. where a LED screen that weighed like 
some amount of tons mm -hmm. la just fell from the top and landed on a dancer. Yeah. And that large company, the big company behind the concert, owned my company. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of backlash with that. And like our higher ups were sort of afraid to move forward. And in the end, they decided, why don't we just shut down the company? Mm -hmm. And at the time, they did ask me, like, hey, like, what do you think? Like, what are you going to do? And I was stuck with a choice. Keep going with the same company. Mm -hmm. Do my own thing. Join another company or change the industry. Completely change my environment. And I was sort of going through, like, a dark time. Like, it was really quiet. I wasn't really making money. And... I wasn't really enjoying the nature of the job anymore. So mm -hmm. I ended up deciding, you know what? I'm going to try something else. And here I am a couple months later, mm -hmm. chefing. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that is really interesting how we are faced with ultimatums in life sometimes, mm -hmm. like pivotal points, yeah. forks in the road, where yeah. you have to choose one path yeah. or the other. It's totally out of your control, pretty much. Yeah, it's out of our control. But, you know, it's... I think you described something that was very much in your face where you were, this, this was coming up as the end of one chapter in your life. And it yeah. was very obvious that it was the end of that chapter. Yeah. And you had a fresh page to write the new chapter, right? And you could have continued doing what you were doing or tried something new. And a lot of our lives, I feel like we are faced with that as mm -hmm. well. Um, but sometimes it might not be as obvious as what you yeah. went through. Right. Right. You've been chefing for three months now, I think, three or yeah, four months professionally. Months. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, chefing is obvious. Everyone knows, like you said, that being in a kitchen is a grueling yeah. uh, position to be in. But we have several movies out here that really uh, glamorize oh, yeah. the lifestyle of yeah. being in a kitchen. Yes, chef, yeah, yeah. chopping up uh, you know, all of these different yeah, yeah. ingredients and serving them to people who... Mm eventually, you know, want to pay their compliments to the chef, Yeah. right? Give us a little insight into what it's been like uh, behind the closed doors. I mean, movies, like, obviously, as in any type of movie, it's, like, super dramatic. Like, you know, yeah. like, don't get me wrong. Like, I live that yes chef life. Like, it's mm -hmm. really intense. I'm, like, sweating and going, yes, chef, and I'm super nervous and chopping onions really quickly and, like, just stressing over, like, I don't know, a hamburger. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, that's all true. Yeah. That's all true. But uh, yeah. I guess what you don't see is, like, sort of, the, like, the hierarchical system. I mean, you do mm. see that where it's, like, oh, there's the head chef mm. and then there's everyone else. Yeah. Right? Whereas in an actual kitchen, like, there's a lot of levels. Mm. You got the komi, which is a uh, trainee chef. You got the demi chef de partie. You have the chef de partie. You have sous chef. You have restaurant chef. Mm -hmm. You have executive sous chef. You have the executive chef, mm -hmm. right? And all those jobs entail different things. Mm -hmm. And the stress of the kitchen is not just service. Service ends in an hour or two, right? Lunch rush. For example, my um, the restaurant I'm working at currently, we have a huge lunch rush because we're in the middle middle of central. And so, like, all the office people go, and it gets really, really busy. But that's, mm -hmm. like, an hour or two of, like, where's my tuna? It's coming, chef, one minute. You know, yeah. like, the, 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 that sort of, like, movie scene. But yeah. service is nothing. Everything else is, is the stressful part. It's the ordering. Mm -hmm. It's the mise en place. It's the making sure all your stuff is up to, up to par. And it's, it's uh, oh, my, I ordered tuna, but my tuna didn't come what do I do now? It's that type of stuff. That's like sort of the real backbone of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, and I want to shout out to these people as well. Stewards, which are the aunties and uncles that clean the dishes mm -hmm. and bring you your goods and make sure you're stocked up with your mise en place, like your dishes or like forks and spatulas and stuff that you need. Those are the real heroes of the kitchen. I'm telling you without, without stewards, you don't have a kitchen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, like, there's so much that you don't see in movies that's just, like, there's, there's so much more to chefing than just, yes, chef, and making nice scallops and plating something nice. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's been really stressful, man. <laughs> it's, yeah. been, it's been super tough. Um, but I do want to sort of, like, expand on that as, like, yeah, now I'm a chef, mm. but that's not necessarily where I'm going to stop. Yeah. And this goes back to identity. Mm -hmm. It's like, who are you, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's an answer to who are you. There's no like, oh, this is my identity. This is who I am. Because we change every single day. That's right. And it's a constant 
ebb and flow of how am I feeling? What do I want to do? Yeah. What am I forced to do? What are my responsibilities? Mm. When I was acting, I didn't really have many responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I came from a good background. I had good connections. I had a lot of free time. Yeah. I can basically do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a chef, mm. right? Mm. But I also have a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I have friends I want, I want to chill with. I have family I need to take care of. Yeah. And as I get older, I see the importance of money more, right? So now I got to think about my salary and I got to rest my body. And like, there's so many factors to like, like just who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've changed vastly over the last three to four years, mm -hmm. especially during COVID. I'm sure everyone did. Mm -hmm. And so like identity isn't really something that is like a one note thing. You yeah. know, it's constantly evolving and constantly changing. Yeah. And so right now I'm a chef. Yeah. I don't know where I'll be in six months. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'll be in three, four, five years. Yeah. Am I going to keep working as a chef and get to sous chef and become a head chef and own my own restaurant? Maybe. Yeah. Am I going to go back to acting? Maybe. Yeah. Am I going to try doing graphic design, which is what I studied in SCAD? Yeah. Who knows? Right. You know? Yeah. Where I'm at now, sure, but we'll see where we go in the future, you know? Sure, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, identity is an interesting one because what you kind of described is from a macro level, mm. John is an actor, John is a chef, mm. John has a girlfriend, yeah. you know, all these things. Uh, and they're very much how people would see you if they didn't know you on a personal mm. level. But really, I think what forms our identities are the interactions that we have with people in all of these different contexts, Absolutely. right? Like when you go to your kitchen, yes, you are the chef, mm. but so are like several other people who work yeah. over there with you. And they know you as a certain kind of chef. Yeah. And it's not just the kind of food you cook, mm. but also w what kind of energy you're bringing to the yeah. kitchen every Absolutely. day, yeah. what your personality is. And perhaps even how to wear a mask mm. when you're not feeling that great about yourself or your food or mm. just having a, an off day. Yeah. And maybe those are some skills that you've picked up during your time in acting, mm. you know, because I do imagine, you know, I mean, they, they say that, oh, we're all actors in this life because we wear so many masks in different 100%. occasions. But when you're a trained actor, mm. are you just better at putting on masks when you have to? <laughs> I've thought about that. Mm. Like, um, yeah, it's funny you talk about off days. Like, I've been having, like, quite a few off days recently mm. um, working as a chef. Because uh, they started me in one station doing salads, soups, and desserts. Mm -hmm. And that stuff was, like, sort of easy for me to pick up. Yeah. And then they moved me to another station, which was uh, a sandwich station. Mm. And then next to sandwich station is grill station. So I've been learning those two stations recently. And it's been, like, a pretty tough time because... A lot of ordering to do, a lot of mise en place, which is our preparation, by the way. Mm. Um, and like, you know, I have to learn all these new recipes and like they're more complex than salads, which you sort of just throw into a mixing bowl and toss up and plate it nicely. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I've been having a lot of off days recently. Um, it's been pretty tough, but I've always put on this like brave face where I'm like, yes, yeah, chef, I can get it done, you know, but like inside, yeah. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's tough, man. Um, and it's funny the other day, yeah, I had this uh, one chef who, you know, I won't drop a name, but this this chef really likes to talk a lot. Yeah, and I was not down to listen. Like <laughs> I was just like so busy that day, and like yeah. I was tired, and I didn't sleep enough the day before. Yeah, and they were just yapping away, right, and mm. um, just not reading the, any social cues. Yeah, but I realized it's because I wasn't putting out any social cues. I was so like jolly with them and like so happy about it. Huh. So after they finally like left, I was like, oh my god, finally, right? And I realized like, damn, I was acting the whole time like I was interested. And it was so easy for me. Like it was just second nature. <laughs> Whereas I see like similar interactions with maybe this chef and someone else. Yeah. And they'd be like, please go away. I'm so busy right now. You know, like they, they just won't even think about like acting like they're interested. Yeah. And I realized like it was so easy for me to just cater to this person yeah <laughs> so maybe that that comes with the acting chops as well like i don't know Could yeah be. it's like a skill it's a, it's a skill you know yeah. <laughs> i feel like there's there's two camps here one camp is gonna say oh that's so fake yeah. you know yeah. you're not being the real you mm. right but then the other camp which is the camp i'm in is yeah. that it's a we're calling it a mask but it's mm. also a way of um managing a situation for a favorable outcome yeah. You know, because if you, let's say, had been like the other example that you just gave, yeah. the person who kind of just waved that person off, like, yeah. get out of my space, that creates a negative environment. Definitely. You know, and in a space that's already fueled with stress, 
you know, deadlines of trying to finish this dish and yeah, get yeah, it yeah. out there. You want to add some positivity to that atmosphere, yeah. right? So in a way, it's uh, it is like sort of trait. managing your situation for a favorable outcome, as you said. I also think in a way, obviously, there's fake people out there. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Like, there's a lot of super fake cats out there, right? Yeah. But for me, yeah. I, I I don't want to toot my own horn here, but I mm. think it's more sort of like an empathy thing. Yeah. Whereas, like, I know how you'd feel if mm. I gave you crap about talking too much. Yeah. Or I know how you'd feel if I didn't respond in a positive way. Yeah. Therefore, I will do that and sacrifice a little bit of my mental health and my patience mm. so that we have a favorable outcome. So. And it, for, for me, it really starts with empathy and it's like sort of understanding how people work and understanding the environment that you're in. Mm. And that's something that's really, really important to me. Yeah. And it could come off as fake, but for me, it comes from a good place. You know, again, don't want to toot my own horn, but it, it does come from a good place for me. So um, I find myself in a lot of those situations like recently where I like mm. in my head, I'm like, Oh, I hate this job. And then when my chef comes in, I'm like, oh, hey, chef, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, can, it can get to that because, again, it's not that I hate being a chef. It's not that I hate cooking, but it's like it can be really stressful and stress like gets to you, you know? Yeah. 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 Do, do you think, actually, I'm just wondering because the kind of characters you would find in a kitchen. Yeah. Did you find the same characters when you were acting on set, how are people mm. different on set? And what are your, how are your interactions different on set versus in the kitchen that you're working at right now? Okay, why don't we do uh, levels? Sure. Right? Yeah. The head chef, executive chef, the boss, mm. right? That's gonna be your director. Um, he's the one that makes all the calls. He's the one that tells you how he wants you to act, yeah. how he wants it to be filmed. Mm. And sort of runs the show. Yeah. Then the sous chefs mm. are sort of like the producers. A lot yeah. of times we think producers are higher because, you know, they put in money and they put in a lot of time. It's true. But they're the ones that sort of run the show in the way of like, um, okay, there's a lighting problem. Yeah. I need to call the lighting guys and sort that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, we need this. I'm going to call this. And uh, oh, I think uh, the actors, is, it's really hot today. So I'm going to call some beverage company and like bring, you know, like, so the producers are sort of like sous chefs. They're the ones that get the stuff together. Mm. And then you have the cameramans, the lighting crew and the sound system, the sound guys. And like, they're sort of, um, the heads of those guys are, are sort of like the CDPs, the chef de parties. They're the ones that operate the show. Mm. I feel like actors, oh, it's hard to pinpoint actors. Um, hmm. Actors are like, they can be, they can sort of be like any position. You have some high level celebrities, A-listers who like to run the show. Mm. And you got some guys that like to help out everywhere mm. and make sure everything's right. And they're going to ask the cam guy, like, oh, does it look good from this angle? Like, should we talk to the lighting guys and stuff like that? Yeah. And then you got sort of like the newbies, mm -hmm. right? Who are just really green and just sort of like memorizing their lines. And like, you know, it's sort of like a commie chef who, who's like, oh, I need to cut this onion perfect my chef's gonna kill me you know sure um so on in a lot of ways there are a lot of parallels yeah in terms of like hierarchy yeah but i do feel like because people in entertainment in general and this is like a huge generalization but in, in my experience people in the entertainment industry are much more like flamboyant and like sort of like ab abstract right-brained yeah other people yeah and so you'll get a lot of people with like artist temper artist temper we call it artist temper mm. um and it's like they're an artist, so we gotta do things my way. Got it. And we gotta, you know, and like I'm gonna be weird because, like, they, they might act sort of weird, but that's just who I am, you know. Like, yeah. Um, and so like it, it is very different in that sense. Like I think in the kitchen is more, a lot more direct. Yeah. And people are like easier to predict. Yeah. Whereas, for for like actors, it's like you can't predict how they're gonna act like you don't know yeah there might be an a-lister who ever you see him as a certain image because you've seen him in all these movies and stuff mm. and then in person he's like a super weirdo like, mm. that can happen right mm. you have some young guys coming in who are really really respectful and humble mm -hmm. and then you have some young guys coming in that are super arrogant and super cocky and they think they're all that you know yeah. so i think in acting and in, in entertainment in general it's like 
it's a much wider spectrum yeah. of how people act. In yeah. the kitchen, it's easier to predict, for sure. You know, your personal experiences are really interesting, and I feel like even people who don't come from similar backgrounds to you can yeah. very much relate to what you're saying. Uh, and that's the beauty of experience, right? Mm. Um, in Asian cultures, we are taught to respect our elders mm -hmm. because even if we think they are wrong, mm. uh, you have to respect them and their opinion and not fight back yeah. because the wisdom is that they probably have enough experience overall mm. to tell you the right thing mm. that you won't understand because of a lack of experience. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting growing up and almost becoming your own parent <sighs> and realizing how oblivious you were at a younger age yeah. with the kind of decisions and even thoughts that you might have been having at that mm -hmm. time. You know, like everything you're describing now to me, which is awesome to hear because I met you nine years ago yeah. and I knew what you were like nine years ago yeah. and I, I know what you're like now and vice versa, mm -hmm. same, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's really amazing to, to see the maturity that has purely come from experience. your very public experiences. Yeah. <laughs> you know for sure which is awesome actually uh because earlier we were talking about personal branding right both of us are from branding backgrounds yeah. and personal branding is such an exciting topic mm. uh and it's it's being spoken about more these days because of the internet because of social media presence um i love building in public you know i'm like falling in love with building in public okay. right because in one way, it's like every time we put out an episode that may not be that good, maybe the camera quality isn't great, mm. the audio quality isn't great. Mm. Those are like public lessons to be learned yeah. because it's like, man, I don't want to fail like that again. Yeah. You know, I don't, but it's trying again and showing up and again and again, yeah. um, which feels really, really good, right? I think- I have something to add to that. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So as we mentioned earlier, like a lot of my growth has been public mm -hmm. and I learned the most from messing up. Yeah. That's just me. Mm. Like it can be, it doesn't have to be in public, Yeah, but when it is in public, yeah, that's when you're like, damn, I effed up, dude. You know, like yeah. I, I've been in that scenario before where like I'm on TV yeah. and I'm rewatching it and I thought I did good. Yeah. And it was absolute dumpster fire garbage. Like it was yeah. so bad. And like, I'm like, damn, everyone just saw that yeah you know and it's it's really really stressful and then you got to push yourself and you're like i can't do that again mm. i have to be better and blah blah and that's always what pushes me yeah forward mm. um and so it's interesting that you're talking about like personal branding and like you know just sort of being in the public eye mm. it, there's something about it that like pushes you a bit harder mm. um i'm not saying it will work for everyone i'm sure a lot of people can't really like they're not built to handle that stress and there's nothing wrong with that because not yeah. not everyone's the same yeah um but for me um uh, when i was doing kingmaker which is the show from view tv uh that it was like the competition where they get 99 guys and they choose like for example in the first season they chose 12 guys and they made a boy band and that boy band is the hugest thing in hong kong right now right, right. mirror mirror yeah um yeah, see, even you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have not heard a single Mirror song. But right, but you know who you they know are. Who they are. Yeah. And like, I'm sure you would recognize their faces if you saw. Um, yeah. And so I was in the second season, and I came in super green. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. I was not ready. I didn't know if I was a good singer. I thought I was a good singer. Mm. You know, I thought, like, oh, I'm pretty good looking. Like, I'm, I'll be fine, you yeah. know, <laughs> amongst all these normies. Like, I have good connections. Yeah. And it was just the wrong way to think. But, you know, that's mm. just how it was back then. I was young. Humbled. And I, I got humbled real quick, dude. Yeah. Real quick. After the first round, I was like, shit, like, huh. that was not nice. And then the second yeah. round, and I was like, that also wasn't that good, <laughs> you know? And then the third round was where I got eliminated. It was the okay. group, group round. Mm. And so some of the responsibility isn't on me. Like some of my group members may have effed up or maybe the choreo wasn't that great and we should have chosen a different performance or different song. All those are factors. But in the end of the day, it was like, I didn't do good enough. If I did really well and my teammates screwed up, they might have kept me, but mm. they didn't because I also screwed up, yeah. right? So, and all of this was in the public eye. So after that, I was like, okay, I'm going dark. Mm. And so I went dark for a year. Mm. And I just, that was when I was like releasing covers mm -hmm. and stuff and practicing. Yeah. And I mean dark as in like on TV. Yeah, yeah I don't want to be that yeah. in view of like, you know, I don't want everyone to see my mistakes. And so I just started doing a lot of covers at home and I like, I bought a microphone and yeah. I would like bought some tripods and like bought some lighting and started setting up. And that was 
the most I had grown to this day, mm. in my opinion. Uh, at least skill wise, that yeah. was the most I had grown. Um, but it was really like knowing that I effed up in front of like so many people. <laughs> yeah, ninety one, ninety nine dudes already mm. that were watching me from backstage. Right, the judges, and then everyone else on TV. Oh, like, wow. dude, it was tough, man. That was really really stressful yeah. especially because i know i knew at the time especially that i carried my father's legacy with me yeah and you said right yeah. wait was that your first introduction into the spotlight was this no no it wasn't, so, right? so I, I had been in like a movie or two mm. uh and i did like a couple like kol gigs here and there like influencer gigs but yeah. this was like the first like sort of big screen time that i had where mm. there was like you know, a solid third of an episode, which was like sort of dedicated to my part because of my background and like all oh, this, okay. you know, yeah. and I was sort of like, yeah, I just screwed up in front of like a million people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, it is what it is. And I grew a lot from it. I do want to ask because uh, like you said, you know, you had like a whole segment dedicated to you because of your background and stuff. Yeah. Now, that's the kind of wisdom that I imagine a lot of the other 99 contestants wouldn't have. Yeah they would fail and they would go back to regular households from mm. like non-acting backgrounds, mm. get whatever feedback from their parents like, oh yeah, you know, you did really well. Well done. Yeah. Don't be so down on yourself. But what did your parents tell you? Because they've been yeah. in the spotlight. They've, you know, can you glean a little, can you, t can you tell us a little bit about I what they said? I feel like this said? is partially like a Chinese thing mm. and like a just, this is the way our culture works mm -hmm. where parents don't mince words, but especially being from acting backgrounds and entertainment backgrounds, they knew exactly what went wrong. Mm. You chose the wrong song. You should, you should have practiced more. Uh, you didn't warm up your voice enough before your stage presence wasn't there. You weren't aware of the cameras. Uh, yeah, y your makeup was too white. So the lighting was making you look like a ghost. Like they had really, really constructive feedback that I did not listen to at the time. Mm. I was like, man, y'all don't know, y'all old, you know, like that, that was like my mentality at like 23 years old, where I was like, like, I know better. I know how social media works. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's different these days. It's not like that, but they were totally right. <laughs> like, like they, this comes with experience and wisdom, right? Like sort of going back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, I yeah. should have listened to them, man. Wow. You know? Wow, man. Yeah. It, it was, it was a tough time, <laughs> but I honestly, it was like, Sort of like the best time of my life as well. As well, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like you did learn a lot. I learned so much, man. So much about myself. So much about where I was at skill level wise. Yeah. Where I needed to go. Yeah. Comparing myself to all these people that were better than me. Comparing mm -hmm. myself to people that were the sim similar to me or worse than me. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. This is where I'm at. Yeah. This is where I want to be. This mm -hmm. is who I want to be like. Mm -hmm. What do I have to do to chase that? Mm -hmm. You know? And I spent a, like a solid year or two years just chasing that and like, really making friends with the people I met in the show and mm. like sort of learning from them as well. Cause I made, I, I've always liked to hang out with like older people. Yeah. Like my, my group, like that I hang out with like very often, like, I'm the youngest guy. Yeah. Granted the other guys are only a year older, but sure. I've always been like that. Like mm. even with like girlfriends and stuff, like I've always liked the older girls. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's yeah. partially cause of like the experience and knowing like, Oh, like you're sort of ahead. Like, you know what you're talking about. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like, learning from those guys. Um, so, yeah, I definitely grew a lot from that. And it goes back to being in the public eye. And, like, I, that's why I'm really proud of you because I see where you've come from your first podcast where it was super raw and, like, you, yeah. you sort of stumbling over your words a little bit and you weren't bringing up the right ideas. To now, I listen to your podcast. I'm like, dude, this sounds like I'm listening to Joe Rogan or, like, you know, like any other podcast, obviously. The, 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 the guests you're having on aren't as crazy. Yeah, you're not going to have Neil deGrasse Tyson on here anytime soon. Yeah. Hopefully you do, but, you know. Yeah. But, like, just seeing the way you've matured and, and being able to watch your journey mm. has increased the intrigue of me wanting to continue watching your journey, you know? Yeah. Thank you for saying that. No worries. Man. That was really kind. Beautiful uh, set, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, man. It's gorgeous. So where did you get this, like, vinyl record player, by the way? It's this like is from L.A.? From LA. Yeah, this I literally was in LA and I bought it there and I brought it back to Hong Kong. Dude. Yeah. Five. I mean <laughs> I mean now you could probably just order this 
yeah, yeah. but at the time <laughs> when i when i wasn't able yeah. to order it so i was like Fair that time. was a I no i really like that. your set like honestly it's so beautiful i wish you guys could see like the back as well it's like pretty nice it's like a nice little like studio space you know yeah i think uh Very cozy i mean since we are on the topic and i have i haven't spoken about the set on any of the other podcasts oh. um the podcast is a culmination of inspirations from the time i was really young mm. Uh, my mom is my I have to give a lot of credit to my mom like culturally mm. because she played all the right music growing up she was the home's interior designer uh. um, she really brought the vibes right home very you know tasteful person very tasteful like an artist mm -hmm. you know um, and when you grow up with that from a very young age, it kind of just forms your identity as well, you know, because right. that's all you ever know yeah, yeah, until yeah. you go to school and you start getting introduced to all this other stuff <laughs> yeah, from other kids, yeah. you know. And I mean, uh, I was listening. I don't know if you know who Sahil Bloom is, but he's like another like, you know, podcaster okay. type of, you know, guy. Okay. He was he was speaking on the experience of being a parent. And he was saying the first 10 years of your child's life are so precious because you are their favorite person in the yeah. whole world. Yeah. But the moment they cross a certain age, mm. they start meeting new people out in the world. Then they start hanging out with their friends and they mm. don't really want to hang out with mom and dad anymore yeah. type of thing. But it is so interesting because those 10 years or however many years you have with your children. I don't know how many parents are prepared to or, or prepared with the knowledge of how impressionable their actions and their influences are on their children. Mm. For life you know dude for life facts because to think that the podcast even like the the cover of the nomadic mic and everything mm. is it's not just uh inspiration from everything at home but also the fact that i played so much gta growing up <laughs> yo yeah. i see it now do you yeah. see it i see it definitely totally. yeah dude I, I i loved getting into car like driving dope cars listening right. to the radio yeah, 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 you know yeah, like yeah, yeah. i i saw all of that kind of just coming together right. into like no, this that's, show. that's a trip, dude. Holy crap. That's that's really interesting. Mm. Wait, I have one more thing to say before yeah. you add to that. And the thing is, I've never spoken about this. Okay. And that's why social media is so powerful as a mm. storytelling tool. Yeah. Because if you're building a brand, right? Absolutely. A brand, yeah. right? If you're t trying to tell a story, forget the word brand for a second. Mm. If you're trying to tell a story, mm. then it really is about at what points in time are you giving people the information that is crucial for them to understand the greater story that's being played out. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Yeah, I understand, yeah. Kobe. Oh, man, I listened to such a good... I listened to the best interview with Kobe that I have ever heard in my life just last week. Okay. It was a random podcast on Spotify. Okay. And I love the episode because he wasn't talking about basketball. The interviewer was trying to get him to talk about basketball, but Kobe went into the film industry and yeah. storytelling industry after he got after he retired from the nba but in this podcast episode he was talking about how storytelling has been an obsession that has been building up for him from the time he was really young mm. and i'm curious to hear what storytelling means to you after i say what i'm about to but for him storytelling when he was 15 16 years old was how can i live my life to tell the greatest story ever wow. you know and i mean you know at first it's remarkable that he's 15 years old and thinking that way mm. but i think what's more impressive is that he thought that way at 15 and he did it yeah you know and he passed away at the very tender age of like 40 yeah. I think he was around 40. But the fact that he had done all of that before turning 40 is remarkable to me. And also, yeah. while I was inspired, it did make me question my life. Not in the sense that, not in the, not in the way where I was like, oh, I'm not telling a great story. Mm. Because I am actively trying to tell a story. Mm. And I'm aware of that, cool. right? And it's not like everyone's going to reach their peak at in their early 20s yeah. some people reach their peak when they're like 40 20, 50 60 yeah. 70 wh whenever you know yeah. it's different for everyone um but yeah it did get me to question like storytelling and branding is actually a very powerful way to live i just think it sounds way too commercial 
because it's being brought up so much yeah. on social media and stuff that yeah. it kind of loses its depth and meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so storytelling, first off, I want to say when I was 15, 16, I was not thinking about how to tell a good story. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I have a lot of good stories, hmm. but storytelling for me is really like just the, the journey that you go on to reach a certain place. And the end of that is just merely an end of a chapter. Mm. And usually the interesting bits are the things in between. Mm. Um, for example, yeah. I can say, oh, yeah, I did all this and blah, blah, blah. And then I ended up making a movie with Aaron Kwok. And oh, my God, it was amazing. Mm. That's just part of the story. That's yeah. not the end of the story. Yeah. Right. Everything yeah. else that led me to that is the interesting part. That's true. How I screwed up during the competition. Yeah. When I joined management and there was all these crazy things going on. Yeah. And uh, how I shut myself in my room and I was recording covers. Mm. That's the interesting part. Yeah. It's not the movie that's the interesting yeah. part. It's where, who did I meet on my journey? Yeah. Where did I go? Yeah. What did I do? And so st storytelling for me is really, firstly, is living the moment mm. and not worrying so much about the outcome. Mm. Because if you're worrying so much about the outcome and it's not what you expected, mm. you're going to be so pissed off and you're gonna be so disappointed that's true and you would have wasted all that time prior because you didn't reach your outcome mm. and you didn't enjoy your process yeah. you have to actively try to enjoy the process and enjoy the screw-ups yeah the losses the wins yeah right the achievements mm. Mm. the journey is much more important to me like i always try to remind myself to live in the moment mm. And I think I did that a lot when I, in my teens. Yeah. Um, sort of funny is like in your teens, you like, you're just there. You live every day, yeah. right? And you never think about the future. Mm. And then when you grow up, all you think about is the future. Yeah. And how much money I have in my bank account and how much money I can make this year. Yeah. And, and what promotion I want at the end of the year. Yeah. And we forget about the moment. Yeah. I feel like education has a huge part to play in this as well mm. it's like well, in our teens we should be thinking about what do i want to do in the future yeah because it's just the beginning of your life man yeah, yeah. you can play you can play in your 20s you know now you should be thinking about like, oh like do i want to be a doctor do i do i like cooking do i like acting like what do i like music what should i do yeah and then in your 20s is when you gotta experience different things right that's what everyone says but it's also like experiencing life mm. it's not experiencing things so you can have a good future it's about experiencing life and finding out what you like mm. and what you want yeah and then you know you can enjoy the moment afterwards as well but i always find myself thinking a lot about the future mm. And I have to remind myself, like, nah, right now is good, too. The process is good. The journey is good. And so that's what storytelling is for me. Mm. Sure, the ending is interesting. Yeah. But the ending wouldn't mean jack if I didn't have a beginning and if I didn't have now. Yeah. Or the journey. Yeah. You know, you know what you said about being in the moment, I think the perception that a lot of people have about being in the moment mm. is being meditative, being still because okay. there's a lot of uh that content that's up on the internet right now yeah you know to be in the moment be in the now yeah be still be meditative Jay Shetty. <laughs> yeah, yeah he and several other people right yeah but uh i'm reading this book right now called uh when breath becomes air mm. right and it's by this guy called paul kaliniti okay. i think i'm saying his name right but he was a, a neurosurgeon that passed away at the age of 36 right and he wrote this book just before he passed after he found out he had um his cancer had metastasized mm. around his body and um yeah he spent his last year or so writing this book about his life and as the as the title of the book suggests when breath becomes air mm. it's his perspective as a neurosurgeon or as like a physician a surgeon in general um instead of being the doctor, he becomes the patient mm. and how he's so used to seeing several patients, several scans and going through the experience of uh, giving patients good news, giving patients bad news mm. to then becoming the patient himself and going through that whole process. But I think the point that I'm trying to get across here is when he was an undergrad, so around the age of 20, 21, mm. he had double majored okay. in English uh, and biology, mm. right? Because at the time, 
he was enamored by books, right? And language and what language could do for a person. But after he advanced in that field, he realized he, he didn't like uh, the way, you know, more advanced, like an English department would think, people in an English department would think, right? Because they, like what you said earlier about uh, an artist, what'd you call it? An artist's ego? Artist's ego, yeah, like yeah. artist's temper. Artist's temper, right? He, he described people in English and literary departments uh, experiencing something very similar, right? Okay. Where you could keep discussing about language for the longest time without mm -hmm. reaching a final conclusion. It's yeah. very much dependent on opinion, right? Yeah. Whereas science is more focused, like there is a yes or no answer at mm -hmm. the end, right? There is a truth to be found. So that's why he became... Uh, that's why he's pursued biology, then became a physician mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But reading his story was amazing for me because he really gave himself to his passions. Yeah. Right. He gave himself to English. He read all the books, mm. you know, then he went into neurosurgery. He was fascinated by how the brain worked. He went into that. Right. Right. And one thing that he had, uh, he couldn't really pursue in his life properly was giving his wife the kind of relationship that she would have wanted because of how much time it took to give himself to his passions, right? Mm -hmm. But with re was it residency and all that stuff. Um, and that was the final thing that he had to, had to give. And if he had made it past residency, which he had one year left in, he could have given his wife that life as well, which he, you'd, it's proven in his track record that he gives himself to what he loves. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he would have given himself to his relationship yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. Yeah. But going back to what you said about being in the moment, that is really what being in the moment is about, right? Mm. It's really about giving yourself yeah. to whatever it is that you're working on, yeah. Yeah. you know? And in a distracted world that we live in now, it is even harder. And that's why so many people are upset because it's so hard to give yourself to something when you're seeing everybody else is up to all this yeah, other stuff at the same time. It's all that um, instant gratification. Yeah. <laughs> it's all that uh, noise from the outside that makes us sort of forget where we are, mm. what we're doing. Um, I think it's as simple as like, I feel like, I don't sound like an old head, but like, you know, <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> um, you know, back when people have conversation, day. at least what my mom told me, because yeah. I've asked my parents about this, because my parents, my dad is 75, 76 this year, mm. and my mom's 75 this year, and so they're from completely different time right they they yeah. had no technology yeah um they didn't have cell phones like they had black and white tvs yeah. um and my mom told me that like having conversation back then mm. is really different from having conversation now yeah and she feels that a lot of young people and she can even tell this from like movies or interviews or even talking to me or talking to whoever <laughs> that we're not as engaged as we used to be as people used to be um it's almost as if she's saying like these days it's harder to find someone who's actively listening to you while you're talking and we're always thinking about something else you know my mind's always wandering somewhere else it's like or you know, you know thinking back to the past or thinking about the future or thinking about a funny meme i saw or mm. what should i eat later or, or uh, oh, i want to go home and play some 2k like you know like yeah. like there's so many intrusive thoughts because there's so much available and we're so used to that instant gratification and always having something to watch. And like, if we don't like it, we can skip it. And then one second later we have something else to watch. And like, yeah, it, it, I feel like it happened a lot with like social media and like technology and stuff. And everyone's talking about this these days, right? Instant mm. gratification and yeah. how phones are rotting our brains. It's all true. Mm. It, yeah. it's, I feel the effects. Yeah. And I feel like we sort of grew up in like an era where we had a foot in both doors. Yeah. We grew up, sort of without crazy social media and technology. That's right. And then as we were getting older, that's when Facebook yeah. and Instagram came in, right? Like I had a Facebook yeah. account when I was like 12, yeah. I want to say. Sounds about right, yeah. And then Instagram when I was about 16, right. something like that, 16, 17, like high school. Yeah. Um, and ever since then, I, I have felt like my, mind's, like my mind wanders a lot more hmm. compared to before. Like I feel like before I was like way more active and way more aware of what's happening. And nowadays it's like, there's almost like a fog. Yeah. I'm not sure if you know what I mean, but like, yeah, yeah, there's like a little bit of like a, right? Like I'm pretty sure everyone our age can like relate to this because yeah. there was a time where it was like, I was way more clear headed. Yeah. Um, and now it's always, oh, Gary V said to do this and now sure. I got to think about the future and oh, I see 
Logan Paul and he's multi-millionaire at like 24 years old and you know like all these people with Lambos on Instagram and all these hot chicks and all these buff dudes and all these gym rats and basketball players <laughs> like yeah. there's so much like noise you know and yeah. like it makes us forget about the moment yeah and so I'm not sure if you've ever done this but have you ever gone like social media dark uh yeah dopamine detox dopamine detox yeah. right there's so many different names for it yeah and like you feel more clear-minded yeah I'm sort of back in the group where I'm like on Instagram, like several hours a day. Now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you wake up, you like go go take a crap or whatever. And yeah. You're like just scrolling through social media. Um, yeah. I'm sort of back on that, but like I also do try to like just not look at my phone so much. Sure. Because it helps me with like active listening and active like being present, being present in where you are. Mm. You know, I hate it when like you're having dinner. Yeah. And someone's just scrolling their phone the whole time. Yeah. You know, and you talk to them, they're like, Fun. yeah, yeah, it's right. all good. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 work was good, work was good. And they just keep scrolling. Like, I yeah. hate that. I hate yeah. that. And I yeah. was that at one point. And mm. now I'm, like, trying to stray away from doing that because yeah. I realize, like, it feels so much better when you know the person's listening. It does. And it's easier to respond and think of stuff when you are actively listening. Yeah. And I don't feel like a lot of people don't have that these days. <laughs> it's true. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's enough. That's perfect, by the way, what you just said. Yeah. And I think that's why I also really enjoy this podcast setting because it's so involved. Yeah, you know, it's yeah, yeah. we are involved in this conversation. Yeah. Um, yo, you just said uh, your mom is the one who told you. Yeah, uh, she brought this up back then. Yeah, you know, people were a lot more engaged, right? Mm. I could speak to you for hours, mm. right? But of course, you know, we're trying to keep these episodes at an hour. And we can continue speaking after. We don't have to. We're yeah, to go home after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. The 70s were, was a very interesting time for oh, yeah. Hong Kong cinema. Mm. And that was when your parents were at their peak in their careers. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. The 70s all the way up to the 90s in Hong Kong mm. were peak times for Hong Kong cinema, oh, yeah. renowned globally even to this day. Like film students study Hong Kong cinema yeah, man. to understand cinema, yeah. right? Um, are there any stories that your parents have told you about that time? colonial Hong Kong when uh, Hong Kong cinema was at its peak or and you know Bruce Lee was alive at that time as well and you know, several other uh, important figures in the industry and the fact that your parents were famous at that time as well is is awesome I feel like that's a very unique um, experience that a human being can have I'll tell you a story about my dad yeah and this is something that really really inspired me um and i always remember this right so back in the 70s obviously no social media and there wasn't as much you know like just marketing and promotion in general so yeah. if you're good you're damn good like you're top of the top if people know you you're top of the top mm. that's why bruce lee to this day because he was the top he was the best he yeah. was the lebron <laughs> right. He was the Michael Jordan of Kung Fu. He was, his slam dunk was kicking you in the face. <laughs> um, and so my yeah. father, he started out as a stuntman. Mm. Actually, that's a lie. He started out as a child actor. Yeah. Because uh, of his family I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, and eventually, you know, he wasn't good at school. He would always make this joke like, Oh no! I never got detention because I was never at school. And I was yeah. like, "Damn, dude, <laughs> like, you did not study." Yeah. And he was like, "No, I didn't." But because he started being a stuntman like at a very, very young age, like in mm -hmm. his teens, and he was like, he followed like a like a, a crew of like stunt guys and like martial artists, and like he learned how to do Hong Kun, which is like a very strong type of like martial art, and like he knows yeah. all these different styles. Yeah, and he learned how to ride a horse, and like these are all things that like it it, it was like a really raw form of training back then. Like, they would have to do, like, the horse stance. Yeah. And stand there for, like, two hours, three hours with, like, a plate on their head. And you don't let it fall. Otherwise, the guy's going to beat you. Like, that's what my father went through. Mm. And he became a stuntman. And he was really, really good on the trampoline. And he had good sword fighting skills. Yeah. And he has, like, sort of a really memorable face. Yeah. But the thing about my dad, which got him his first ever opportunity, mm. and this is what made him different, was, like, back then, um, when the, let's say you got a bunch of stunt guys on, and they're doing a fight scene and the main characters in the middle, whatever. And cut. All right, good take. All right, five minute break. All the stunt guys would go off and like, you know, smoke cigs or do whatever. And my dad would stand at the screen watching. Um, 
this tiny little gray box, right? Uh, watching the footage, watching the playback. Yeah. And there was this director who basically, I mean, my dad owes his career to, who was like, he, he noticed him after a couple of times and he was like, man, this kid's got potential. He cares. He, he likes what he's doing. He's not just some, some other asshole, you know? So he's like, you know what? I'm going to give him a role. Mm. My dad gets his first ever leading role in 69. And in 70, he films a movie called Vengeance. And he won Asia's Best Actor. Wow. And the second ever Asian, I, I hope I'm getting this right, but the second ever Asian film festival wow. held in Indonesia, I believe. Mm-hmm. Could be wrong, but I think so. And he won first uh, Best Actor. My dad was born in 47, and yeah. in 70, yeah. he won Best Actor. So at 23, wow. <laughs> he basically won like wow. the Asian Oscar, right? That's crazy to me. And mm. it just goes to show how different back then was compared to now because now it's all about clout and like yeah. how many followers you got yeah. right some yeah. director is not going to look at some stunt kid yeah be like oh you're hard working let's give you a shot it's like nah screw that let me just yeah. go on instagram and see who has the most followers and like let's hire that guy right yeah um because that's what makes sense for business but back yeah. then it was like that yeah it's like oh this kid has heart he's yeah. good on a trampoline he's good at sword fighting let's give him a shot like mm. it was very different back then it was much more raw it's yeah. much more human in a way yeah um, and my mom, you know, she was leading lady at 16, so <laughs> she's even more impressive. But, uh, yeah, crazy thing is, like, my dad found his passion at a really, really young age, mm. and now he's 76 and he's still acting. And he was acting from when he was like four years old, so he's been acting for 72 years. Isn't that insane? That is insane. It's crazy. He stuck with one thing for 72 years. I can't even stick to one thing for 72 <laughs> hours, man, like, you know, let alone years. That's crazy, man. So it was, yeah, it was like super different back then. Yeah, that is really different. Um, what was your, how did your dad's life change after he won that award? Oh, I mean, it's just movie after movie after movie. My Mm -hmm. dad's been in like 150 films. Wow. Plus. Yeah. Um, most of, most of them locally, any international ones? A lot of locally, uh, he did film international a couple times, not very much, but like with China. Yeah. Uh, he, he especially these days he goes up a lot, um, because they need like you know old veteran actors and stuff and yeah you know, that's totally my dad so yeah um but man dude 70s was a crazy time like, yeah a lot of drugs a lot of crime mm. a lot of crazy stuff happening especially in the entertainment industry i'll tell you another story sure and this is like probably my dad's like most badass story awesome like, super super badass mm-hmm. um so i don't know like he had some friends like be like you know after the set let's go for drinks at the disco <laughs> at the disco at the disco <laughs> uh, definitely not the club <laughs> yeah at the disco yeah um and so but i was like sure right mm. so it goes brings my mom along and they're like walking into this club disco music playing right yeah. flashing disco ball yeah and they walk up to the table and like um the guys are already there and like they're sort of drunk already right so my dad sits down starts drinking with them and there's this like one actor starts talking crap Hmm. to my dad i don't know why i guess he was jealous i think because like my dad like he was supposed to be the leading guy and then the director ended up giving it to like my dad or something yeah. right like some some petty stuff and then uh this guy starts talking crap and he's like he's like, oh yeah your father owes me money like oh yeah blah 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 like talking all this crap and like starts cussing at my dad a little bit yeah my dad's like man screw this guy like i'm i'm out right so he takes my mom leaves He's like, oh, you taking your lady with you, you little bitch? Like, something like that. Like, you see, he makes, like, an out, out of color Ooh. comment. Like, just something, like, really rude. Yeah. And he's, like, standing up. Yeah. And my dad just turns around and just boots this guy in the chest. Like, Ooh. straight teeth kick. Like, boom. And this guy falls onto his back. And he's like, don't talk shit about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> And he, like, he leaves. And the next day, like, his producer calls him. He's like, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> like, what the heck did you do, man? He calls him into his office. Guy is, like, sitting there, like, with his shirt off, showing him the oh. bruise. He's got, like, a big ass. Like, <laughs> he's got, like, a big ass boot print on his chest. Oh, my like, God. Yeah, we should call the cops or whatever. And, the, and then the producer's like, yeah, what did you say to him? And then, like, the guy ended up having to apologize to my dad. Oh, wow. But that is, like, such a badass story, right? And I was like, man, the 70s was a crazy, crazy time. Yeah. Like, they didn't even, like, call the cops at yeah. the time you know <laughs> at like a disco club imagine if that happened now oh man come it on. would if be on the news if you're on like it would be viral like Dragon, it would be viral it man. It'd be everywhere and like your career would be over but it back then be. there was like the wild west yeah 
much. Anything goes. Yeah. Fend for yourself, you know? <laughs> Man, what you just described, literally, I, view, I played it out like a movie in my head. Yeah. That was a movie. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Fantastic, man. Well, what, what about your mom? Because you said your mom yeah. was the leading lady when she was 16 years old. Yeah. Right. And your dad was a martial artist, whereas your mom, what kind of roles did she play? And what was her career trajectory like? Um, so the leading, like the, her first ever leading lady, she was like a student. Yeah. She was like 16. So obviously she looked young and she was a student and it, it was very much so like wasn't damsel in distress, but it was like, it was like the female lead, like, you know, yeah. that type of like, um, soft, yeah, soft, you know. but then also gorgeous. Yeah. And like, you know, like that's the, that's the girl that it's the girl next door. Like that was sort of like my mom's vibe. Yeah. And then later on she started taking on more roles, uh, doing like those old fashioned Chinese movies where you got the hair tied up and you're wearing robes and stuff. Yeah. Um, really, really wide range. My mom also did a couple like action movies and stuff. Mm. Um, Here's a pretty crazy story about my mom. Um, she had her legs like run over by like a sixteen wheeler. What? Because <laughs> basically back then, like stunts were like super super raw as well. Like, dude, it would not have been accepted today. Like the way they did that stunt. So basically, it was like they're filming the last scene of like the series, and her and like the leading guy, they had to like jump off of like a moving truck, and and land on like a mat. And like no wires, like you know, <laughs> you know, just super dangerous. Like you know, they never would have been passed like in this day and age. And so she jumped off, and the truck just just ran over her legs, and she was she had broken legs for like half a year, and she was like in a wheelchair for a year or something. Is that crazy? Dude, that's crazy. <laughs> that's like, like I don't the even that, know what that's, to say. that's like the seventies for you, man. <laughs> like that's wow. that's how different it was. But that's also why like Hong Kong cinema was so well respected because they had all these crazy stunts and people were like, how do you do that? Mm. They actually did it. That's how they did it. There was no CGI back then. There was no crazy photorealistic backdrops back then. It was like, that's right. We need a scene where you jump off the truck. You're jumping off a truck into like (laughs) some friggin' apple carts, like, you know, some apple card boxes, cardboard boxes or something. That's right. And I feel like Hong Kong cinema is famous because they almost paved the way for what cinema became in other parts of the world in the consequent decades, right? Yeah, man. And that's how ja- Jackie Chan became famous too because he yeah. was famous for doing his own stunts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly yeah. what you just described, crazy stunts that crazy nobody stunts, else could man. think about doing. Yeah, but man. the thing is, that's why it's so important to have a background in martial arts mm. because in martial arts, you learn how to fall, yeah. you know, from like a certain height. Yeah. You learn like the, the tumble roll, like yeah. when you when you, when you you come down, you know? You, you yeah. know how to, how to balance out your weight yeah. in different uh situations and all Definitely. this other stuff and like having that sort of like base um like for example like my dad's really good with the sword yeah like he's fast and he he yeah. carries like sort of like mid-sized quick swords yeah. so like he's really really fast with his movements and he's good with his legs as well yeah um but he learned that from having a really really good base and mm. learning how to be really unbalanced on his toes and, mm. and you know having like experience with all these things these days like you can't really learn that and be that natural with it because sure. you know okay if i get like a role right now i don't know how to sword fight yeah i don't know kung fu i, I can box mm. but i'm not gonna you know if i'm a kung fu guy i'm not throwing a boxer's punch right yeah and so i'll probably need some training and so like a, you know a month or two before i start filming i'm probably gonna take some sword fighting lessons and they're gonna use the camera editing to help me back then yeah. everything was one take everything yeah. was one shot because they couldn't afford to have three four cameras and they couldn't afford right. to be spending all this time cutting film yeah. and p- piecing it together yeah. right so yeah. my dad's done a scene where it was like straight up it was like a seven eight minute fight whoa and it's one take seven one eight minute fight fight scene okay one take one shot two floors yeah. up and down and yeah. he's just fist fighting with this one guy he remembered all the choreo yeah. and like his uh, the guy he's fighting was like his really good like Shundi, which is like his bro. Yeah. And they like trained together and stuff. And like they literally, there was just this one take fight where it was like a seven eight minute fight, and they're just doing all these crazy moves and like climbing on tables and stuff. I'll try to find it and like hopefully we can like throw we it can up. clip it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It. Wow. If we can find it, like it's a really really legit fight scene, man. And that's only because they they were trained for it. Mm-hmm. You can't really do that these days. Mm-hmm. I mean, Keanu, he's amazing, and John Wick is amazing, and they have these really really beautiful scenes, but back then it was different man like they were built different yeah like my dad got whipped by his master all day and that's why he's one of the best mm. right same as bruce lee he got whooped when he was a kid this has been 
a very insightful conversation and it's it's really great man because knowing you for so long we have had so many conversations so many good conversations mm -hmm. but we've never touched on certain topics that we have today yeah. you know and yeah. i've just thoroughly enjoyed this conversation not mm -hmm. just getting to know you better as a person but the movie that's played in my head as we've had this conversation has been very very entertaining Absolutely. for me same for me man yeah um to end the nomadic mic episodes i always ask my guests this question okay which is if you had to have a conversation with your younger self what would it be and if you had to have a conversation with your older self what are you hoping that conversation would be damn that's all right take a sec man <laughs> Take your time. To younger John, I would say, that's tough, bro. Cause I'm I'm still learning, you yeah. know. And yeah. like, I I feel like I'm not qualified to <laughs> give my younger self um, any type of solid advice. But I would say, man, really just enjoy your time. Really just enjoy your time. Things are not as bad as they might seem and think a little bit more about your future and stop always living in the moment because that <laughs> you should save that for your 20s. <laughs> and to my older self, I'm saying, man, I hope you found your way because at the moment I'm honestly still super, super lost and that's okay. Um, and I think this is something that I want to say to anybody from our generation or younger mm. or even older mm. is that it's okay to feel lost. Yeah, it's all right to not know who you are or be confused about who you are or not know where you want to go because you don't need to think about where you want to go. Just be here. Be present. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy your time on this earth and be grateful every day when you wake up that you're alive because it's a beautiful thing. A beautiful, I'm getting choked up. It's OK to cry, dude. Beautiful thing to be alive. Um, and a lot of people don't have that, you know, so yeah, just, uh, find your way and take your time doing it because who knows where life's going to lead you. Yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> awesome. John, this was a pleasure. Thank you. Man. I'm so happy about it. Like, honestly, I was like sort of worried. I was like, uh, am I going to just ramble on? Which is uh, what I feel like I've been doing. But at the same time, it's been great to just talk about everything yeah. and nothing at all is at the same time. It's just been awesome. Like, it has been. Yeah. It just feels like a normal conversation between the two of us, you know? It, it does. A little bit more like direct questioning, but like uh, otherwise it just feels like a normal, normal conversation. That's why Nomadic Mike is a good show, man. I feel so at home here. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I am. It really, really feels like it's just we're at home you know yeah, just man. having a really chill conversation yeah, it, it feels like a safe space where you can like sort of just let let everything out so yeah any future guests that are watching this is a good show <laughs> you should come on neil degrasse tyson looking at you <laughs> <laughs>